The 1973 Yom Kippur War was one of the highest intensity conflicts of the Cold War era. Israel and the Egyptian-led Arab alliance threw everything in their arsenals at each other, with the fortunate omission of Israel's nuclear stockpile. Support from the US on one side and the Soviet Union on the other allowed the conflict to carry on long past the exhaustion of pre-war stocks of vehicles and weapons on either side. Over a thousand tactical fighters took part, and many hundreds were shot down. Fifty years on, the proportion of those that were the victims in an air-to-air fight remains the source of some debate and conjecture. Contemporary accounts had it that the vast majority of Israeli losses were the result of surface-to-air missiles and AAA. The majority of Arab losses were due to Israeli fighters. In total, the Arabs lost several times as many aircraft as the Israelis. Probably the most complete view of the contemporary analysis can be found in a 1978 study by the US Air Force into the Arab-Israeli conflicts from 1948 to 1973. This is the table of their findings, direct from the report. As you can see, the conclusions they drew, likely mainly based on Israeli accounts, was that 287 Arab aircraft were downed in air-to-air combat for the loss of only 21 Israeli. If you're doing the math, that's better than a 13 to 1 kill ratio. Incidentally, the Israeli pilots originally made 343 claims, so the US assessment took the original total down by 16%. In total, the US report states that the Arabs lost 367 aircraft, the Israelis lost 103. There's a couple of things to keep an eye on here in my view. The first is the large number of helicopters that are in the Arab numbers. There are 45 in the total losses, but the way the numbers are presented in the cause table doesn't differentiate between fixed and rotary wing. Now I'm all for shooting down helicopters, but they're essentially defenseless targets and therefore shouldn't be factored into an assessment of the air superiority capabilities of air forces. The Israeli claims say that they shot down 20 helicopters. So just to get a basic estimate from the US data, for now I'm going to knock off the same number as the US did, and in due course I'm going to go from 287 to 270 fixed wing kills. Oh, and having said that helicopters were defenceless, on the 18th of October, a formation of Egyptian MI8s attacked the HQ of the 162nd Armoured Division. They were set upon by Mirages and Phantoms. One of the latter attempted to down an MI8 flown by Ahmed Lofty Hilal using its jet wash but the Israeli pilot miscalculated. Rather than flying over the top of the helicopter, he went underneath it. Finding himself right on the deck, the Israeli pilot tried to pull up and climb away. Hilal let loose with a salvo of 64 S5K rockets and vaporized the big fighter. All sorts of strange things happen in combat. That said, let's try and make some sense out of the statistics. Now, as I said at the outset, getting good data is tricky. Part of the issue with claims in general is that the pilots have little choice but to extrapolate what happens to an aircraft they're firing at once they've released a weapon. The 1973 war was no different. Engagement ranges were close. Although Phantoms were armed with sparrows and fired 49 of them during the conflict, there's little evidence that they were regularly able to engage beyond visual range. Once a pilot shot, he needed to maneuver to prevent becoming a victim himself. There isn't a great deal of gun camera footage out there to act as verification, and even where hits are shown, I find numerous examples of aircraft returning to base with significant battle damage. For example, a MiG-21 managed to return with a whole chef rear embedded in it. This intelligence windfall was transferred to the car of one of the engineering officers to be transported away for further analysis. Unfortunately, it chose that moment to explode, nearly killing the unfortunate Egyptian officer. My method has therefore been to locate personal testimonies online and in books and to use it in an attempt to validate the official records. Sources are in the show notes. The official US assessment says that 187 Egyptian aircraft were lost. In a February 1974 Radio Cairo interview, Anwar Sadat said that Egypt had lost around 120 planes, which is a sufficiently large number to feel like an honest admission. It also tallies well with contemporary Soviet assessments. Egypt started out with about 366 fighter aircraft. It didn't receive any reinforcements from the Soviets over the course of the conflict, and I'll count Libyan and Algerian aircraft separately. 
With 120 Egyptian losses, that would mean that a third of the inventory was destroyed or otherwise written off. If it was 187, that would mean that half of all Egyptian combat aircraft were destroyed. The Soviet assessments point to 54 Egyptian losses in air-to-air -air combat, so that's 45% of Egyptian losses being to Israeli fighters. Another useful point of context is that Egypt produced 6,815 sorties in the period. If the sorties were evenly distributed, which they weren't, and I'm aware of that, then it's less than one a day per fighter. If the Soviet numbers are to be believed, then an Egyptian pilot was shot down by an Israeli fighter once every 120 sorties, and one to all causes every 56 sorties. As we all know, Syria became ever more of an autocratic mess in the years after 1973. Facts are generally the first victim in such a circumstance. The Soviets assessed that Syria produced 4,568 sorties during the war. Syria had 193 active aircraft at the outset and it did receive some from the Soviets in their air and sea lift. The Syrians had the weakest pilot roster at the outset of the war but they were operating over a much smaller geographic area, reducing mission duration somewhat. Their sortie production rate was somewhere around 0.9 sorties per aircraft per day, so quite equivalent to the Egyptian. Israel claims to have shot down 153 Syrian aircraft over the course of the conflict. That will be 80% of the entire fleet. The Soviet number puts total losses at 110, but this includes Iraqi and Egyptian aircraft operating in Syria. Take those out of the picture and you get to about 100 Syrian losses, which is still extraordinary attrition. Over half of their starting fighter fleet was lost. Israel claimed 97 air-to-air -air kills on Syrian aircraft. Based on my analysis, the real number is more like 55. The odds for Syrian pilots were therefore much worse than for Egyptians. They lost a fighter to an Israeli fighter every 80 missions, and one every 45 to all causes. 80% of the Iraqi sorties flown in October 1973 were in Syria, and correspondingly that's where they suffered most of their losses. 30 Iraqi planes were lost, consisting of 15 Su-7s, 8 Hawker Hunters, 5 MiG-21s, and 2 MiG-17s. Iraqi pilots claimed 5 kills. I can substantiate three of them. Algeria lost two aircraft. I believe that Libya lost two as well, but the data is patchy. We're talking tiny numbers in any case. Israel started the 1973 war with 365 fighter-type aircraft. I believe the US estimate of 103 losses to be pretty accurate, as it was in a classified document, and it is likely the US had a reasonably precise read on things. The losses break down as 32 Phantoms, 53 Skyhawks, 11 Mirages, and 6 Super Mysteres. The IDF were able to produce a remarkable 12,320 sorties over the course of the conflict. It is, however, worth noting that Operational Nickelgrass delivered between 43 and 45 F-4 Phantoms and 46 A-4 Skyhawks from October the 14th to the end of the war. Pilot availability was more of a limiting factor for the Israelis than airframe availability. Israel was therefore producing nearly twice as many sorties per aircraft per day than the Egyptians or the Syrians, which is impressive. Air-to-air -air losses are more challenging to come by, as Israel has historically been reluctant to admit losses to this source. The US assessment was 21 losses in air-to-air -air fights. The Israelis admit to losing 14, 5 on the Egyptian front, and 9 on the Syrian. My bottom-up assessment, based on triangulating Arab claims with Israeli losses attributed to other sources, is that Israel lost 32 combat aircraft and a Dornier Doe 27 observation plane to Arab fighters. 28 of those were shot down by MiG-21s, and the remaining 4 by MiG-17s. 14 were victories by Egyptian aviators, 16 to Syrian, and 3 to Iraqis fighting on the Syrian front. In terms of sorties, that means that an Israeli fighter was shot down by a MiG every 385 sorties. It's a telling statistic when you compare it to once every 120 for an Egyptian pilot and once every 80 for a Syrian. In summary then, my estimate based on the information that's come to light in the last 50 years is that around 360 fixed-wing tactical aircraft were destroyed in the Yom Kippur War, 
Of these, around 150 were shot down by other fighters. That's about 40%, wildly higher than what the US experienced in either Vietnam or Korea. About 60% of the pilots and navigators of the downed Israeli aircraft survived. Only between 20 and 30% of Arab aviators escaped their doomed aircraft with their lives. A tragic toll. As I said at the outset, the intensity of this conflict was remarkable. It was, in many ways, comparable to the situation that the US and NATO would face in a full-on fight with the Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact in Germany. The US was quick to send teams to analyse the war in detail. The consequences of the hyper-lethal battlefield, heavy attrition of resources and enormous rates of material consumption were very stark. The US was going to need more equipment and higher quality equipment if it was going to win such a conflict. For example, research teams found that the Israeli F-44 started the war on October the 6th with 86 operational aircraft. By the 15th of October, as the first US replacements arrived, the Israeli Air Force had been reduced to 59 operational Phantoms, a reduction of 31% in 10 days. The US extrapolated these results onto a potential European war and found that comparable attrition would expend US Air Forces in approximately two weeks. Alongside this, Israeli usage of air-delivered ammunition was extremely high. The Israeli Air Force dropped its entire inventory of CBU cluster bombs plus another 1,600 of 2,460 replacements provided by the US, finishing the war with only 859 CBU-58s versus a pre-war supply of 4,670. The Israelis also fired 175 of 276 AIM-9s, and 49 of 106 AIM-7s. Shrike anti-radiation missiles were also heavily employed, with 197 fired, far in excess of pre-war stocks that had totaled just 145. The Israelis weren't happy with the Shrike at all. They wanted an improved version in the US concurred, starting development of the harm as a result. The new F-4 Wild Weasel could fire the standard arm, which was obviously much better. The operations directorate related Israeli statistics to US Air Force holdings and concluded that stocks were nowhere near sufficient for a high-intensity conflict, especially for air intercept and anti-radiation missiles. USAF Europe required 60 days of stocks but only held enough for 30 days of fighting, probably less given that a European war would likely have been even more intense. The Yom Kippur War therefore showed that the US Air Force would need to assume high levels of material attrition and munitions employment in modern conflict. Issues of quantity played into discussions regarding the optimum high-low force balance proposed between the new F-15 and the developmental lightweight fighter candidate, the YF-16. It was clear that the US would need not only capable aircraft, but numerous aircraft, along with great quantities of consumable stocks. An important observation as the US military contracted in normal post-war fashion after the end of its involvement in Vietnam. The large buy of F-16s can therefore directly be traced to the Yom Kippur War, as can the F-117 stealth fighter, the Harm anti-radiation missile, and the large inventories of weapons like the AGM-65 Maverick standoff missile. Despite the doldrums in which the US Air Force found itself in the 1970s, its ability to fight the Soviet Union in Europe actually increased markedly. The 1973 war should have been even more starkly informative to the Soviet Union than it was to the US. In the air-to-air battle, the R-3S Atoll was markedly inferior to the AIM-9D in Shafrir. The probability of kill when firing an Atoll was only 5%. In the Middle Eastern context, the AIM-9D in Shafrir had a 30% probability of kill on trigger pull. The AIM-9G, supplied by the US during Nickel Grass, was even more effective and could be fired from higher angles off the bore site. A new version of the Atoll did appear in 1974, but it still didn't have the performance of the AIM-9D. Because even the latest MiG-21M and MFs and the Su-20 lacked chaff dispensers, flare dispensers, or any form of ECM, they were far more vulnerable to missiles than the US and French-built fighters on the Israeli side. Although the early assessment was that the Arab forces lost 17 aircraft to SAMs, my analysis is quite different, and the real number could be as high as 50 kills by Hawk batteries and two or three made by red-eye man-portable systems. 
There are helicopters in that number. But my view is that Hawk was actually more effective than the Soviet systems that receive all of the coverage in the West. Incidentally, the US post-war assessment was that the Israelis could have made better use of the ECM pods supplied by the US, but they were unwilling to use an experimental mode that interfered with the continuous wave radar of the SA-6 because they feared it would allow the missile to home on them. Back to the Soviet Union, dynamically only the MiG-21 MF could keep up with a laden F-4 Phantom at low level, and even then it would run out of fuel very rapidly in the attempt. Egypt had been lobbying the Soviets for the latest MiG-23 in the year before the war. This would have given them a more effective interception capability and represented a surprise to the Israelis, but I doubt it would have had much overall effect. Neither side deployed airborne warning and control during the conflict, but Israeli standoff jamming was far more effective. Some of the Arab pilot interviews say that their GCI communications and the radars themselves were often jammed, leaving the MiG-21 stranded above their airfields using visual scanning. Lack of look-down, shoot-down capability on the Phantom meant that they couldn't take advantage from beyond visual range, but the F-15 was only a couple of years away. The technology offset was stark, and the list was long. Even the basic weapons the Soviets supplied, like unguided rockets and bombs, were too light relative to those available to the Israelis. They were ineffective in soft soil and it does rain in Germany. The cannons in Soviet fighters proved inferior to the 30mm DFA and M61 Vulcans in terms of shell spread and thus accuracy. The Egyptians did have some access to anti-radiation and cruise missiles and used them well, but they expended their meagre stocks in the first days of the war and received no new ones. Shorter range standoff weapons weren't available. In short, the Soviet Union should have been alarmed both by the intensity of use of weapons and the manifest inferiority of those weapons, but they weren't. Reading Soviet assessments, they repeatedly remark on the inadequacies of Arab aviators. They point to tactical errors in their poor use of GCI at the outset of an engagement, leading to poor positioning. When engaged, they were too aggressive and would often end up sandwiched between two flights in an Israeli four-ship formation. What they missed was that Arab comms were often jammed, and Arab aviators' improvisation and in-cockpit aggression was often unrewarded because of the weaknesses in the weapons they were carrying. The fundamental concept of the MiG-21 was flawed in an air-to-air context. It was a point-defense interceptor designed to go up, shoot something down with perfectly performing missiles from a perfect intercept position, and then return to base. It was good for ambushes, but not for full-on high-intensity conflict. And of course, those were the conditions in the Middle East, and they would have been the conditions in Central Europe. MiG pilots would rise to intercept and then become engaged in low-level fights with a large number of very fast and committed enemies coming from all sides. They had to use the afterburner extensively in these fights, leading to them becoming critically short on fuel and often short on weapons within a matter of minutes. Then when they sought to land, they either find the base still under attack or the runway littered with debris. I found numerous stories of pilots having to eject or make belly landings because they couldn't use the runway. The MiG-21 made up the bulk of Soviet frontal aviation's order of battle in the early 1970s, and the Yom Kippur War suggested that it would have only been marginally effective in a war between the Soviet Union and NATO. Given the characteristics of the MiG-23, it's hard to imagine that it would have been much better. It was a massive gas guzzler at low level. Although it did carry the Apex air-to-air missile, the early versions were still only able to carry four missiles in total, and until the AFID appeared, pilots couldn't actually fire the two atolls on the fuselage pylons because they stalled the engine. The Soviets allowed their bias against the Arabs to mislead them. No significant lessons were learned, and it would be another decade before they managed to close some of the quality gap via the introduction of the flanker. In summary then, my view is that the air-to-air kill ratio achieved by the IDF in the 1973 war was not 13 to 1, but was more like 3.7 or 4 to 1. Given the extreme intensity of the conflict, that was an outstanding performance by Israel's defenders. But it also represents a creditable performance by Arab aviators, allowing them to restore some of the pride that they had lost in 1967 and the constant skirmishes thereafter. 
both sides could therefore reasonably claim to have scored some form of a victory. Whether it was worth the price is not for me to say.